I'm Leo Phillips, host of This Must Be The Gig. We're a weekly podcast that documents everything about the world of live music. Speaking with choreographers, costume and set designers, the people who run beloved venues and festivals, and, of course, speaking with musicians about that one gig that changed their lives. Get your peek behind the curtain at consequenceofsound.net, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Consequence Podcast Network. And welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sounds and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Uh, always appreciate it, especially to you all listening who uh, subscribe to the series. Uh, of course, uh, we put out new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if this is your type of thing, if you like hearing about your favorite artists, what they're up to, or you want to discover some new ones or know what's happening in the music world, staying up to date, hit that subscribe button. iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening from we've got a way for you to subscribe and to get a brand new interview delivered straight to your preferred listening device every monday wednesday and friday i'm kyle meredith and today i'm going to be talking with jeremy zucker he's got an album called love is not dying that we're going to be getting into as we discuss the therapy of writing uh, as well as writing a song cycle with a big concept it's all laid out as one song bleeds into another on this record he'll get into what he calls the intense overwhelming beauty coupled with basically the apocalypse. It's it's an album about love and death. We also discuss making uh, use of guitars in meaningful ways, not just in very obvious ways, uh, with the guitar being one of his main instruments, but also the piano as he taught himself how to play it as he was writing the songs. Interesting trick there. We'll also hear about themes of uh, uh, being in a relationship with someone who's battling addiction and uh, and dealing with their mental health, as well as how he found success in Southeast Asia. Uh, was kind of a big thing in the past year. So let's jump into this, discussing the album Love Is Not Dying. It's Kyle Meredith with Jeremy Zucker. Hi, Kyle. This is Jeremy. I, I, I'll throw these compliments to you first. Love Is Not Dying. This album, it, it's sort of a masterpiece in, in a way. I mean, uh, what you've done here, you know, the, the full journey of, of this record, it's so fun to listen to, but as a complete piece, I mean, it's it's a hell of a concept that you pulled off. I, I wanted to bring up a quote first because I think when you first put this, when you were first talking about the record online, you said, making this album changed my life. What what exactly did that yeah. mean? Uh, first of all, thanks for the compliments. It's very kind of you. You know, I I did put so much of me into the album, which is why I think that making it really did change me. Music has a very therapeutic process for me. Therapeutic process, and I, not in the traditional sense where it like makes me happy, although it does. More in the sense of when I write a song, I'm very much like reaching very deep inside of me for feelings that I maybe don't acknowledge or things that I don't often think about that I feel like I should be thinking about. And in making a song about it, I sort of like, it becomes sort of realized in front of me and I get to almost like therapize myself. So every song that I write about an important thing that happened to me or that I was involved in, or just like a significant mental process that I had to go through to make that song, I almost always come out of it on the other side, sort of having experience writing that song and having processed that little part of my life. Yeah. Um, so, al- so always I sort of like come out of it with a different or new perspective. And I sort of feel like I grow after every song. So after this long process of doing that, you know, for, for 13 songs, making the album definitely changed my life. Which makes sense. And it's it's interesting to see the evolution of, of your writing, too, because going from one-off songs, EP, singles, that whole thing, to creating something that is an album. And, and I'll point out again, you know, for those who, who may have just heard one or two songs online in, in the way we do these days, it's a full piece. I mean, I don't know if you call this a song cycle, a, a mini opera, or what, but, but in a sense... You've made an album in a time, in a genre, and in a time where albums aren't always thought of in the exact same way. How did that come about? I've always just been a fan of the, the cohesiveness of projects, um, and you know, I think that's why it took me so long to make a full-length album because people these days are just not adjusted enough to sit down and listen to a whole project. And I'm definitely guilty of that when I 
listen to music myself. Um, if an album is like more than 40 minutes or more than like 13 songs, I get really bored of it. And it's hard to sit down and consume it all in one session, which is how albums are supposed to be consumed. So yeah, I think that's why it took me so long because partly I, I wanted to make sure that my fan base was ready for it and that I had enough support to really command the attention of a lot of people. And another part is I never really felt ready to embark on a whole body of work. Music is something that I just sort of fell into. And honestly, I don't feel like I, I've never felt like I had one big concept that I wanted to explore until I started writing this album. Was this something that you, you decided on writing the record and that became the project? Or were you working on this and at the same time you were still able to do some of the other uh, tracks that you'd been putting out or w was it completely separated it was completely separated like my music making process i sort of fell into it i i didn't sit down one day and was like okay my album love is not dying it's about all these different things i'm going to make it which i think is how a lot of people go about making music and i'm honestly sort of jealous of that because i feel like i don't have a lot of control over the songs that i write because I, I try to make them so honest and so like, I don't know, like a mirror image of my experience. And I don't know, I can't like force that or fake it. And if I, if I feel like I have nothing to write about, I'm like not going to be writing music. With it though, the way, the way it is laid out and I'll, I'll hit on the album point one more time too, because it's not just still a collection of songs that sort of hint on the same themes or everything. I mean, you've made it orally. The songs bleed into each other, you know, as one song's tailing off, you don't quite realize that, you know, we're listening to the next song at, the, at that point. And I think that's what I meant a lot of times as the journey of this album. Was that something that you noticed during it was happening? Or is that something that comes after the songs are written and you go, how do I put this all together to make it flow? Well, the process really started with me coming back from tour a year and a half ago. And I wrote a couple of the songs off the album, not really knowing that I was working towards an album. I think they were Always All Care and Julia were the first two that came out that, that I wrote. And I think after I wrote Julia, I realized that that was like a, a feeling, an emotion, and honestly just a vibe that I knew I could sort of expand upon. And I sort of just kept making music around that feeling and expanding it to all these new things I was experiencing as time moved on. And certain songs had a very specific cohesiveness to it where I was like, this is what the album sounds like. And other songs just came out of me where I was like, aesthetically, they don't necessarily fit in what I imagine this album is, but they're such amazing songs and they fit the storyline of what's happening to me while this whole album is happening. And so what happened is I sort of got together like the flow of how these emotions were hitting me if I were to sit down and experience them all linearly. The songs aren't ordered chronologically, though it is a concept album. It's not like set up to tell a chronological story. It's more just a, like a storybook of emotions. And the way the songs flow into each other is definitely a very specific decision. Um, there are a few places where I, I had the very specific intent of having the end of one song be the be beginning of another because Honestly, like I, a lot of times I, I would write those songs together, like I would finish a song and it would, the first song would end in a very specific way. And I was like, okay, this is something completely new. And I'm glad that it just naturally resolved into this ending because this ending is a beginning for another song. And then comes the fun part of, part of, of choosing where I get to chop it up in the track list. But so certain songs had that very intentional process of, um, of going one to the other and then other ones sort of just fit together naturally I, I don't know if you can really define the sound in the way you're talking about it but you use the word you know the feeling that you realize that we're, we're, we're showing themselves in these songs what exactly was that vibe and feeling that you were noticing the main one i think is is very much expressed in the first two tracks of the album and it's it's this feeling of intense overwhelming beauty sort of coupled with you know destruction and almost an apocalyptic narrative but you know sort of set as a metaphor in relationships it's it's like honestly in the text of the title the title of the second song we're fucked it's fine it sort of tells it in a kind of funny sort of way um but it's really like this these dual themes of love and death of beauty and destruction of you know choosing to experience something amazing that you know is going to tear you apart i find there are moments of Interesting contradiction, as you said, especially, I guess, since it's not written in chron or not placed in chronological order, because not your friend following always I'll care. I mean, that's that's two ideas that really butt up <laughs> against each other. Totally. And, that, you know, when you 
when you bring out new instruments, I guess be, it becomes even more noticeable too. Because yeah, I wrote down the ter- the phrase "meaningful guitars," and I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. But it seems like like the catharsis that well, I hear it as catharsis in what's happening in Lake House. You know, it's suddenly mm. when you bring in those guitars, it becomes something different. Guitars are everywhere; they're all they're they're in lots of songs. You know, it's not something that I would automatically think. And there's guitars. But was there a thought process that went into using sounds in that way? Totally. My main instrument is guitar, um, and that's how I write a lot of my songs. But I find there to, to be a certain amount of repetition in the way I would write songs with a guitar, which is sort of frustrating. So I really try to involve as many different instruments or synthesizers or samples or inspiring sounds as I can to inspire my writing in a different way. And in that way, when I do bring guitar into it, It's very purposeful and very specific. Like I said, guitar is my main instrument, but I don't feel like I'm an amazing guitarist. I definitely like do a lot of takes to get the part perfect. And I put a lot of thought into what the part is. And I'm never sort of just playing to play. I think as guitar is used as sort of a passive instrument in a lot of ways. Um, And I just don't just don't really enjoy (laughs) producing it that way. Uh, Some of the most outstanding moments on the record, too. It's also interesting that guitar is your main instrument, because, you know, if if you just were to listen to this record, you're a pianist uh, or keyboardist, synth, you know, whatever. Uh, It it almost seems like keys take the front and center for most of it. Totally. I think there's a certain amount of luck in that. Um, I grew up playing piano, but when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I just started to hate it and really wanted to play guitar and sort of convinced my parents to let me pick up the guitar. And I guess I wanted to quit piano also, which is a very regrettable decision now because about two or three years ago, I could barely play a chord. Um, So I've been really slowly teaching myself how to play. I can really only play in the key of C, in the key of G on the piano. And I have a very rudimentary knowledge of chords. And in recording a lot of the piano parts for the album, which I did myself, um, I very much had to like teach myself how to play the parts that I was writing, which is an interesting process. It sounds like it would be a little bit long, but it's also a story as old as time, right? You know, kid is given piano lessons, rebels against it, takes up an entirely different instrument. <laughs> yeah. You know, some of the songs on here, I mentioned Always I'll Care a minute ago, uh, which, you know, a, a great song. There are songs that have obviously found an unintended relevance post-pandemic and, and now with the protests. It, it, do you hear some of these songs in relating to, you know, uh, current events in that way? Yeah, I think there was one specifically that fans were pointing out like, wow, this is strangely perfect for the time we're living in right now. But people have, have sort of drawn that um, drawn that idea that it was written. I mean, it came out during quarantine, but I wrote a lot of these songs like way back. I mean, I think that happens anyways, you know, as listeners, as fans of music, as you know, we tend to hear what we want to hear. We try to hear ourselves in the music, obviously, uh, with with connection like that. But when you put something out in the world and and suddenly maybe it it starts speaking to something much bigger than your intentions. I mean, it's got to be an interesting moment for a songwriter. Have you experienced that much? Totally. I mean, that happens all the time. I, I always say to myself that art exists between the intent of the artist and the experience of the listener or the audience. And that, I mean, my songs get reinterpreted all the time. I can pull like a couple funny examples. So my song, Not Your Friend, which is sort of like the pop anthem of the record, starts with, tomorrow is your birthday. I thought it was last Thursday. And everyone's like, I mean, this is sort of like a cheeky example, but they're like, oh, like Jeremy forgot a birthday. He doesn't care. Haha. But the line, like if you look at the next couple lines, it's we know you love a party, go celebrate and I'll be blah, 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 blah. And the idea is that like I like it, it's about this type of girl that wants to celebrate her birthday multiple times and like the, and over a couple of weeks. And it's about this sort of archetype of, of this L.A. girl that is super superficial. And a couple of my songs are about on this album specifically, it's about being in a relationship with someone that's uh, battling mental illness and addiction. And, you know, a lot of that isn't necessarily you can't really pick it up in certain circumstances if you don't know, if you don't sort of know that going into it. And so it's really interesting to see. Uh, you know, I get DMs all the time from fans saying about how this song helped them understand this situation. And I sort of look at it. I'm like, that's so sweet. That's so awesome. But that's not what the song is about. <laughs> you know, I don't tell them that, obviously, but it is really cool in that way. And so many people have connected with, with your music. I mean, it, you, we don't have to get into the weeds too much on the on the numbers and everything. But of course, you know, the the streaming numbers and the followers and everything. I mean, it, you've you've garnered so many connections in what seems like such little time, 
to. And I know you've been doing this for a while. You've been releasing music for a few years now, but but especially in the last couple of years, I mean, w- w- was there the point where you realized, wow, this is absolutely taking off? Yeah, I think that moment happened with Come Through, you know, maybe six months or a year ago. And it was weird because it was it was taking off in the U.S. and it, it got the top 40 radio, which was awesome. Um, and it sort of stayed in like the 30s and 40s for a while and dipped off. And right after it sort of came off the U.S. chart, it started to blow up in Southeast Asia. Um, in Indonesia and the Philippines. And I think this song is like still in the top 40 in a couple of countries. And it came out, you know, it, it peaked a year ago at this point. So Come Through really like exploded me as an artist in Southeast Asia. But, you know, that that was like the big holy shit moment. But before that, every EP that I put out sort of had a song that I was like, oh my God, this song is so much bigger than the rest. This is crazy. Like, this is the moment. I'm so excited. And every time I would put out another EP, I would have a single on it that would do better than the previous. And I, that sort of put this expectation on myself to continue to sort of beat my last record not necessarily in the sense of like making sure that it's more successful but making sure that I'm making better music from the project before and yeah it was like I could go way back into like my college SoundCloud days with the songs I was releasing that I would freak out about the response it would get but from my commercial releases it started out with Talks Overrated on my EP Idol that was a really big song at the time for me the next one was All the Kids Are Depressed off of my project Glisten which was an even bigger song at the time for me and then it was come through up summer. Yeah, I don't know. It's just been it's been crazy. Like watching every song I release that does well, like it brings in all these fans and they listen to my catalog and then there's that many more people listening when I release more music. So I feel really blessed in that way, especially now having released my debut album. I feel like I can take so many more risks and not worry about whether people are gonna hear them or not because I know people are gonna hear it and you know, I'm not as concerned about making hit record. Even though I haven't had like a true hit, you know, I still feel very successful um so i don't feel like i have to compromise for anyone which is really great i mean obviously you're doing something right and and i can even say that again tying it back into this record love is not dying you're absolutely doing something right with with what you're doing and 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 what you're putting out in the world so so thank you for doing that uh and I'm, i'm so happy that you've made the music that you made i'm enjoying this album and what you've done before but um and thanks for taking the time to talk about it today man yeah of course thanks for having me no problem it was a pleasure and uh take care out there we'll see you around uh you know whenever that starts happening again <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> cross my fingers all right man take care all right thanks Kyle. all right bye bye my thanks to Jeremy Zucker. Again, that brand new record, Love Is Not Dying. It is a beautiful piece of work. Thanks to Jeremy. Thanks to you, of course, for checking out this episode. Before you get out of here, if you're not already, I do hope you hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with us. Again, there's new interviews put out into the world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you do want to keep up with your favorite artists and know what they're up to, if you want to discover some new ones that you weren't hip to before, or just want to you know, know what's happening in the music world, hit that subscribe button. Any place you can get podcasts from that does include iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, even YouTube. After that, head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres and music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews. WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound, they've got your music and film news. You can also find me on uh, most of the social media hotspots at Kyle Meredith. Please follow and like along there as well. That does it for another edition of Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media.